Well, where's the rest of the band? <laughs> um, you know, uh, before I get started, I just want to talk a little bit about, <coughs> you know, LTV and the Hamptons Jazz Fest. Uh, LTV was there when we really needed them the first year. And uh, so they'll always have a, oh, I guess, yeah. So they'll always have a, yeah, I want to talk about LTV and the Hamptons Jazz Fest. They'll always have a nice place in my heart. Um, that being said, uh, both organizations uh, are run, uh, need, need help. So I don't want to pitch this uh, too heavy, but if anything, if you can go to the website and contribute a little something, that's a wonderful thing. But I'm really happy to see you all here today and uh, kick this off and uh, see what happens. Uh, I'm going to start with a uh, standard called uh, Yeah, right. The song is you.
So part of this thing is that we're, you know, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm up on the stage here, but I want to make this a little more informal that, you know, if you, anyone would like to ask me a question about anything I've done, I'll try to answer it. I found that, you know, when I was teaching, that's some of the hardest stuff, you know, some of my students will say, like, what did you just do? <laughs> and I go, like, do I really have to figure that out for you? You want me to write that out for you? You know, but... Sometimes that's the gig. Anyway, but if anybody has any questions at all a a after any tune, I'll be happy to try to make some sense out of it. But that was a pretty loose interpretation of that song. In fact, everything I'm going to do hopefully is going to be pretty loose uh, interpretations of whether it's my tunes or standards. Uh, but okay, we'll, uh, we'll continue. I'm going to play a, a song of mine. This is uh, entitled Blues for Billy. It's uh, dedicated to the great drummer Billy Hart, who I've had the pleasure of playing with a bit recently. And uh, it'll be on a CD that we did a few months ago that actually it won't be a CD. It's going to be on vinyl, and it's going to come out uh, probably early next year on a European label. So anyway, Blues for Billy.
So, you know, every now and then I like to channel a little monk in there or something. Go ahead. Yeah, as you improvise your way through a piece, are you thinking like several notes ahead? Or mm. does it just kind of happen in the instant? Yeah, I think I'd rather be right where I am. If I'm thinking ahead, that's, I'm probably not in the moment. You know what I mean? You want to be right, right where you are. I mean, that doesn't mean you're not think you might have an overall arc to what you're doing. But yeah, I want to be as close to right with it as possible. Yeah. All right, we're cool. Does that mean you're actually making it up as you go along? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we got to have fun, right? That's the fun of it. The fun of it is, uh, is just, just, you know, letting it go. You know, you practice and you practice, and you have an idea of what you like. I think that's one of the toughest things as a, as a musician to figure out. It's kind of like, what do you like? You know, and once you figure out what you like, then you can try to make that happen. You know, because if, if you don't, if you don't, know what that is, you're kind of swimming out there in the ocean, which, which is really beautiful right now, isn't it? Isn't that water great now, you know? Anyway, uh, well, you, uh, a lot of you know I, I'm heavy into the Latin jazz thing, too. And uh, I'll draw on that a little bit this evening. But I'm going to play a tune that I probably recorded more than any other song. Uh, and this is by my first real employer uh, uh, in the jazz world, Mongo Santa Maria. So I'm going to play uh, his great tune, Afro Blue.
Okay. Well, you know, sometimes I like to take tunes that have, uh, you know, well, well, it's really like a folk song, right? You know, doo dee doo dee doo dee da Any of us could have written that. You guys could have been walking down the street, doo dee da da doo dee da da You know, and it, but it's so simple that you can take that and rather than playing over a set of harmonic changes, you can just go anywhere and develop it and have some fun with it. I guess I hope you guys get that sense that I'm going anywhere. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, a friend of mine said, Bill, you know, you're always writing these songs that are like, you know, kind of uh, sort of, you know, a downer in a way, you know, like, you know, like uh, Enough is Enough is one of my tunes on my last record, you know, I would call it a change is going to, it's going to come and, you know, sort of a few tunes, one tune is called Chaos, um, I don't know. And uh, so I, I thought, okay, all right, well, you know, that's not all there is to life. I like to get all the emotions in there. So I'm going to play something I wrote a couple of months ago. Uh, and I'm going to call this, it's a little samba, On the Bright Side. <laughs> you know?
there. There you go. See there, I, I do have a bright side, right? For all of you who think I'm just going to write dark tunes that reflect the dark times. Um, oh, come on. Any of us who are out here in the Hamptons, there's a lot of brightness. We're here. This is a beautiful place to live. However, uh, I am going to go on to the other side right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as a composer, you sometimes know where tunes come from, and sometimes you don't know where they come from, you know, depending upon what's going on in your life. Uh, this tune, I knew exactly where it came from, because I wrote it a couple of days after 9-11. Uh, when that happened, I didn't touch the piano for a few days. And then I sat down, and this is what came out. So I want to share it with you. This is called After the Dust Settled.
Thank you. You know, before uh, things got crazy between the United States and Russia, I was lucky enough to play over in in Moscow and did a concert at Tchaikovsky Hall. It was, it was great. If they only treated me the way they treated me that week in the rest of the world, it was a, they, Tchaikovsky Hall is like this Lincoln Center place. A big picture of me there, you know, it was like, wow. <laughs> This is great, you know, and the uh, place was, you know, we had 1,500, or, but the place was sold out. And I played that song, and uh, they recorded it, and I ended up putting that song out just as a, a solo CD, just that song, because I felt like it meant something and it deserved it. Anyway, so to get back onto my bright side, uh, this is a tune. Uh, I wrote a while back. If Monk wrote a cha-cha, this would be it, maybe. Monk's cha-cha.
Does anybody have any other questions? You know, anything about, you know, you want to try to dig into my inner sanctum? <laughs> yeah. Which category in the Grammys are you nominated? Oh boy, this is, this is the weirdest. I, that's a very normal question with a very weird answer. Uh, you know, I've done all kinds of things in my life that I'm really proud of. And I'm proud of what I got nominated for the Grammy for. But it was crazy. I did an arrangement for this uh, gentleman named Richard Barada, uh, who's a film producer. And he asked me, he had worked uh, before, and he's a drummer also, now he's drumming. He said, Bill, you know, I, I worked on the movie Big. You guys remember that movie Big with Tom Hanks? And they do the FAO Schwartz thing, and uh, they play Chopsticks. So I said, Bill, do you think you could do an arrangement of Chopsticks <laughs> that we could do? It? Well, I, maybe I can approximate it. I don't want to play the whole thing. But it was... Uh... I did my Latin thing, and lo and behold, shock of the world, I got nominated for a Grammy for that arrangement. And, you know, Vincent Herring, this great saxophone player, he, he you know, I, I ran into him after that, and he said, but Bill, you know, it was a hell of an arrangement. <laughs> yeah, so, so there was, yeah. Did you say Rick Barada? Rich Barada. Rich, Rich Barada. It was, it's on his record. If you could go home and Google it or ask for it on Spotify, you can, you can hear my arrangement of chopsticks that got me nominated for a Grammy. I did not win. Some other guy won because he did some big band arrangement of uh, some video game theme. But uh, being nominated was fun. We went out to Vegas, my wife and I, and we, we lived the dream, you know, went on the red carpet, did the whole thing. It was, uh, it was kind of fun. Anybody, uh, any, any other questions? All right, well then we'll keep going. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play another ballad. This is um, a tune that I played many, many times with the late, great John Lucien. He made this tune as his own. If you haven't heard John Lucien sing, go, go to Spotify and ask for it. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. Tremendous spirit, and tremendous voice, tremendous musician. Anyway, I'm going to play uh, Joe Beam's Gingy.
So if you if you go back and you listen to John's version, hopefully you're going to hear some of John and and what I just did. Any other questions out there about this this music? Anything? Yeah, go ahead. Right. I love the right. And I just respond to it, you know, without thinking. Mm -hmm. And then there are other uh, forms of music which are less melodic, let's say, to someone like me who just is uh, instinctive about music. So, how is it that some songs just resonate with the person, some melodies, and other melodies? Don't, but yet are considered very important and, and Right. Well, that's a million dollar question there. I wish I knew the answer to that, because then I'd write those million dollar tunes that resonate with everybody. Um, it's, it's a very personal thing. You know, it's a personal thing. So that tune happens to mean something to you. It happens to mean a lot to me, too. Um, you know, every great piece of music does not get everybody. I mean, somebody else might think something is totally great and another person thinks, well, I, I don't know, it just doesn't do it for me. So that's just, we're all individuals. I can't say why that is, except I'm just happy that some tunes resonate with you like that. So I would, I would rejoice in that. Well, I was thinking about more modern music So modern music, leave, it doesn't affect you the same way? Right, it leaves you a little like some of the stuff I'm doing there. Are you going like, why? Are, what the heck is he doing? Right. Uh, see, that's that's the thing. Well, it, um, you know, it takes it takes effort, and it takes I, that's all I can say. It, it, it's a development of your ears, maybe, uh, to go on the adventure to take in uh, all the the beautiful music is in that's out there in the world listen everything doesn't get me either um, it's a it's a tough question it's it's really uh, an individual thing you know uh, but I would say just be open you know you're here listening to me so that means something you're opening you're opening up to some things that maybe you haven't heard uh, go out and buy my solo record, you know, <laughs> or CD, you know, and then you'll maybe listen to it a bunch of times, and then you'll start to hear things over again, and you'll go like, wow, that, yeah, I kind of, I kind of get what he was going for. Well, what is your solo record? Huh? What is your solo uh, It's called Monk's Cha-Cha, and uh, it's out on the Savant label, the label I've been recording for the past 10 years or so. Right, dissonance. It's dissonance. Yeah. So that is, many people think that's very good music, and it may be very good music, but how do you get to... Right. Well, well, you know, I, I, taught it, I taught at Rutgers for like 13 years, teaching their piano students and other things and theory and all that. So I came up with a term for that. And it was called, I, I said, the term is dissonance tolerance. And everybody has sort of a different amount of that. So it depends, you know, like if I play, if I play this, To me, it's kind of inside. Um, I have developed my dissonance tolerance to a high level. <laughs> I, I like that stuff, you know? I like it when notes kind of crunch against each other. Um, 
more than I ever did, actually. As I get older, I think I like more things that kind of don't add up theoretically, but they kind of work for me musically and energy-wise. Uh, it's kind of nice when you play something you don't know what you're playing. But it's, it's yeah, it's, it, dissonance can be uh, jarring, but it can be beautiful. Like Monk wrote a tune called Ugly Beauty. You know, and that's, that's kind of what it is. You know, things can be beautiful yet very dissonant. I think the longer, you know, I mean, it's again, it's personal taste. You know, it's personal taste is how much of that you can tolerate, you know, or, or even enjoy. You know, hopefully I, you know, I might play something pretty crazy that sounds dissonant to you, but I think I come back. Nothing you play sounds dissonant to me. Uh, oh, great, great. Beautiful, well, thank you for that. <laughs> Any other question? Anybody, somebody else had a hand raised with? I had a hand, I just... Go ahead. Mm. Uh, you know, any music I approach, I try to bring myself to it, whether it's Latin, but it ha a lot of my life it has been like integrating Latin and jazz and stuff and whatever influences I have. Um, you know, I think we all have something to offer. You know, I'm an O'Connell. I'm not uh, O'Connellis. I could have been in another life. I could have been Cuban in another life. But something touched me about Latin music uh, in my 20s, because I didn't grow up with it. Uh, but in my 20s, being in New York, I heard salsa bands and stuff, and I went like, yeah, wow, this is great. Um, so I got into that. And then, you know, you, you approach it from a point of respect. Like, I learned as much as I could about the typical way of playing. And then I said, okay, man, now I'm gonna bring my, myself to it, you know? Uh, and that's, that's the fun of all this stuff, really bringing yourself, bringing your personality, trying to create something uh, that is your own, hopefully. You know, that's what makes Monk great, that's what makes Train great, that's what makes all of them great. And we all have that, it's just how much we can let that in. Does that sort of answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah, you know. Uh, well, I think I'm gonna play one more tune. Um, this has been fun. Thank you all for coming, you know. And, uh, Really, keep in mind we have a few other, you know, we'll have this Monday night thing going here, so uh, please support. Well, I think next Monday is one of my students is coming down, Luciano Minetti. Uh, great. Well, I had to give the youngsters a chance, you know. Uh, he's uh, one of the best students I've ever had, and, uh, you know, if you're free next Monday, come on down, he'll probably knock your socks off. Um, I'm not sure what to play. Well, I'll play something. Oh yeah, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, I'm gonna play Bye Bye Blackbird.
Thank you, thank you. It's been a pleasure. By the way, I do have a few CDs here, but you know what? On the radio today, I said I was going to give away a few. Now, I, if someone heard me on the radio say that, if you showed up, I would give you a CD. I all right, then come on up. Then come on up and. and I heard and, you on the radio. Uh, all right, all right. I got five to give away. First five. All right. <laughs> see you. I'll see you. Thanks a lot. The great Bill O'Connell. Thank you. Hang on, Bill. Come on over here. Ah. ah. Bill? We have a present for you. Oh, isn't this that is, this beautiful? Is a, this is Baron Lewis, and this is our own there Bill O'Connell. Oh, that is really sweet. And we wanted sweet. you to have this as a small token of our appreciation for tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Hope you had as good a time as I did. It was fantastic. Don't forget, next Monday, we have another wonderful pianist. And uh, again, thanks for coming, and uh, have a wonderful night. <laughs>